And are you having heat waves where you are? Oh yeah, it's like god awful hot. It's and it's but the thing is, it's so like out in Arizona, mm. it gets this hot, um, but it's dry mm. here. Like you just walk out uh, and you're drenched. You're like, yeah. yeah. Oh, so I god. went for a bike ride Saturday, <laughs> and, and like, as you're riding along, it feels it, it doesn't feel all that bad because you have the wind and the winds whisking mm. away your moisture and your sweat. But as soon as you stop at a traffic oh. light, all of a sudden you're just like. <laughs> <laughs> I purposely hung back because I wanted to record the other guys I was riding with, right? Because mm, okay. like just me out in front would have been like a sort of a boring video. So, um, but so they were like coming up to the light pretty quickly, and they had to slow down. So, yeah, we made it from Forty Second and Broadway all the way to the Holland Tunnel. Mm, that's that's brilliant. amazing. Yeah. It's, so, it's so cool. It's so, uh, it's so much fun. It's it like took, it's yeah, like yeah, stupid yeah. and adre- it's it's one of those adrenaline rushes where you're like if you really think about it it's like well, that's probably not the smartest thing we do <laughs> <laughs> you know, especially like with my history with attracting automobiles yeah <laughs> but when you get done with it it's like oh wow that was so wicked going on. rush yeah that's yeah, awesome. that so, great it's, video it's so it made me made me pretty envious just like because we had a, such a good time last year there it's like oh man i want to go back there again it's so cool <laughs> yeah, and New York is yeah, New York is a special place. I think it's like a place to, you know, like a lot of the you know a lot of cities, right? So it's like it's good to be around there. And then before you get too jaded and too cynical, it's time to leave. Right? Yes. So. Yeah. Waking at dawn. All righty ho. So good afternoon there, Michael O'Brien, OB, our man. Thank you so much for joining us again on the Ridiculously Human podcast. <laughs> yeah, Gareth, Craig, good to see you guys. It's awesome yeah. to come back. Great it's, to see you. It's the sequel. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Better than the first. <laughs> With most movies, except for Godfather, the sequel isn't that great. So but this, <laughs> this one will be better. This will be uh, in the whole spirit of Godfather 2. Totally. Yes. Well, we love that. Well, but- Without the bloodshed. Yeah, 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 that's a good call. <laughs> well, I, we actually both just wanted to start off with just to say a massive thank you to you uh, because you've actually been such a massive help for us in terms of helping spread the word of our podcast and introducing us to amazing guests. I, I think probably five or six of our last, maybe like 10, have been thanks to introductions that you provided us with. So just you know, from, from the bottom of our hearts, thank you so much for, for thinking of us mm-hmm. and, and just uh, being there and, and having our backs and these sort of things. It's really, really awesome of you. Uh, no problem. Boy. Well, I'm a huge fan of you guys. And so this is like, it's the easiest thing in the world to do. And I know sometimes you, you'll ask me like, hey, do you have a question for the guest that you recommended? Mm-hmm. And so then I'm listening to the podcast and either Craig, you say it or Gareth, you say it. Say, hey, now one of our listeners, Michael O'Brien, I'm like, oh, who's that guy? And then it's like, oh, that's me. That's my question. And then I'm like, oh, gosh, I hope the question was a good question. So, <laughs> so that's Always a, been amazing. Yeah, that's a little surreal. But no, I'm a huge fan of what you guys are doing. And, and there's some really awesome people in the world. And I think awesome people should know each other. Yeah, yeah that's man. for sure. Love but, it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, man. So, um, yeah, so... Uh, Actually, we spoke to you, like we said um, before, and that was almost 70 episodes ago. It's kind of hard to believe for us. Um, <laughs> so I think for, for people that are, you know, haven't heard your first episode, we encourage them to go and listen to episode 29 because your story is seriously epic. It's uh, very inspiring uh, what you've done, what you've gone through and uh, where you are now, of course. Uh, but maybe you can just sort of provide us with a, a few minutes sort of overview of your, of your kind of story, a brief overview. Yeah, yeah sure, I'd love to. Um, so I would say like my upbringing was pretty typical here in the States, like a suburban kid. And I wasn't necessarily in, I was into sports. That was like my big thing. Like I thought like to be a pro athlete in whatever. So in that, that dream changed depending on the seasons. Even <laughs> like when, at one point I dreamt of being a pro bowler. So, which is, you know, a lot of, we might've just lost a whole bunch of listeners with that. <laughs> that but I, like sports was a big thing for me. School wasn't, and it wasn't, I just wasn't inspired by what was being taught. And so I was okay at school, but I wasn't great at school. 
but sports was sort of my jam. And, but I, what I thought is that I had to sort of follow the script that society wanted me to follow. Like you work hard in high school, you go to college, you get a gig, uh, you might meet someone, marry the someone, start a family. And then this gig that you have, you just sort of work your way up the corporate ladder and you have a happy life. And I was doing that, I thought, fairly well. I wasn't necessarily aware. I wasn't necessarily living my life with much mindfulness. Some of the things that, we, that are commonplace today, like around mindfulness and thoughtfulness and you know, empathy and awareness that, you know, thanks to the internet and a whole bunch of TED Talks and <laughs> some wonderful podcasts, we know that these are important characteristics of a healthy, rich life. I knew nothing about that back then, right? So I was just sort of just on my hamster wheel doing the hamster thing, like, you know, just churning away, following the script that I thought society wanted me to follow. And then you fast forward to 2001, I had a pretty good gig at the time. I was the marketing director for my company's flagship drug. It was like the big drug for our company. I would often joke that if we miss goal, if we sneeze, the whole company caught the flu because if we miss goal, the whole company missed goal. And we were then living in New Jersey. I'd been married seven years. So I met that someone special. I married her. And then we started a family. And my two daughters were under the age of four. So Elle was three and a half and Grady was seven months old. And I brought my bike out to a company meeting out in New Mexico, north of Albuquerque, because I really wanted to get my ride on, get some exercise, avoid the hotel gym, Across New Mexico off the states uh, that I've ridden my bike in because I have a, a, a dream to ride my bike in all 50 states and I thought I was being the smartest one I was sort of returning to bike racing I was an avid cyclist even during my high school days and after the birth of our two daughters I thought well I'm gonna go try to get back into shape and that morning of July 11 2001 which I call my last bad day which I know we'll talk more about in which we talked about a lot in that first episode I was doing a couple laps around the hotel property. I was going to do 10 for a total ride of 20 miles. And as I came around the fourth, the fourth lap, there was a bend in the road and a Ford Explorer was coming right at me. Mm-hmm. And he was going about 40 miles an hour based on what the police said. Mm-hmm. And I remember, I remember everything about that morning, the sound of me hitting his grill into the windshield. I went, I broke through the windshield, which is nearly impossible mm-hmm. for anyone that's tried to take like a baseball bat you know, like on a wild weekend and try to break a hole into a, a windshield. I'm not sure why someone would do that, but if you've ever done that, like you know it's really hard to do. Well, I broke a hole right through the windshield and I remember the screech of his brakes and the thought I made to, down to the asphalt below. And to make a long story short, as they put me onto the helicopter, I promised myself that if I lived, life was gonna be different. I would stop chasing happiness because what I was doing on that hamster wheel was doing a lot of chasing happiness. Like I'll be happy when I get promoted, I'll be happy when I get more stuff, I'll get, I'll be happy when I have all the stuff that all the people around me have because I didn't know it at the time, but I was suffering from comparisonitis. So I was doing all this conditional happiness. Hmm. Work. And at times I would catch it, but then it would fly away and then I'd go back to chasing, back on my hamster wheel. Hmm. And so what I knew then was like, I had to live life differently. You know, the accident became one big major pause button. I had no idea how, but I knew that if I was gonna make it through this, I had to honor my survival and just show up differently. And the first surgery lasted about 12 hours. Uh, The next four days I was in the ICU. And when I came out, that was sort of the beginning of my recovery and it started out pretty dark until I had a big shift in how I saw things and I knew I had to get my mind right if I was going to get my body right. Hmm. And you also had some, obviously a massive recovery after that. And you had some people around you that were just incredible as well. And obviously so much, so many things happen after a serious event like that. Yeah, there were, well, one, the, the, the leader of my Peloton, as I like to call it, You know, for those that don't know what a Peloton is, as far as your listeners, you think the Tour de France, all those cyclists in, you know, in the road, on the road to France, uh, riding along in their Lycra and all that jazz like that, that's a Peloton. And they need 
collaboration and they need to be together and they share workload and they need trust and communication, all these wonderful things. Well, I had a medical peloton, if you will, of all the people around me helping me get better. And the leader of that was certainly my wife. Um, mm -hmm. How she did it, I still don't know to this day. One of the best pieces of feedback I get when someone reads my memoir is they when they pop me an email or they might be local and they see me and they're like, I need to meet your wife. Your wife sounds amazing. Mm -hmm. And she certainly is, you know, not only back then, but current day. Uh, but I, yeah, I had a whole bunch of people in my life that sort of put me back together, sort of like Humpty Dumpty. And, mm -hmm. you know, and I learned a lot too about how people show up when you're in a crisis mode. Mm -hmm. you know, there were t people that I expected to show up, Craig, that showed up. I was like, okay, check. There are people who I thought were going to show up that didn't. Hmm. I was really angry hmm. at them for a while until I sort of thought through that. And then there are people that I didn't expect to show up, but showed up in major ways. And, hmm. you know, and all these, you know, they, and everyone deals with hmm. a crisis in their own way. Even for the people who didn't show up, they're still part of my life, many of them. They're just, they're, you know, when you think about like who's in your life, they may not be great in crisis, but they may be great in other places of my mm. life. And so sometimes you just don't know what to say when someone's at their lowest point. And so when you get in your own headspace that way, sometimes you just, you hold back. You don't lean in because you just, you just don't know what to say and you yeah. don't know how to help. So what you tend to do is you lean back and you, you, know, you don't help. Um, mm. Because we're all, I think we all deal with it. Everyone in my life dealt with my accident through their own lens, their own perspective. Mm. And everyone had a valid view of what was happening. And I, that's one of, the, one of the best things I learned along the way in terms of like judgment or not judging and just the value of perspective. Yeah, for sure. And, 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 and one thing um, which, uh, which, is, which is interesting, I think, is like how those people the ones that do help actually really help you uh, recover quicker and sort of, uh, you know, get to get to that healthy state again. Um, our stories are quite uh, similar in, in one regard in terms of I, I had a serious accident when I was um, 16 and only since like, I guess, talking about it more and us doing the podcast and Craig and I also interviewing each other, but I like thought about this more in my recovery. And I reckon for me, it was the people and the support around me, which really actually got me through it. It's like, that was, that was such a big thing, you know, and then we, you, you talk about it a lot in other aspects of our life, but surrounding yourself with, with the right people is so important. It really is. And I don't think we spend a lot of time really sort of just reflecting on like, who's in my life mm. and are they the right people for me at this point in my life. You know, sometimes we, you know, we get into high school and we tend to sort of gravitate to the people who are in our classes and maybe through sports or extracurricular activities. Mm. And then our friend group sort of appears. But then once we get through college and into adulthood, you know, sometimes it's through people that we work with, but then there's, a, there's just more openness when we get into our 20s. Mm -hmm. And you start thinking one I think you should start thinking about like well who's around me who like who can I lean on who can help me clarify things who can help me in a crisis who can help celebrate do I have the right people in my life and knowing that people grow and evolve and change sometimes the person that's in your life when you're 25 isn't necessarily the right person to have in your life at 45 mm, totally. and that's that's this is gets to the difficult part to say hey maybe I have to sort of cut some people out of my Peloton or out of my life that no longer really serve me or fuel me. And probably I don't fuel them. So what we, sometimes we don't necessarily hit it head on. We let it sort of just die naturally. And that's one way, obviously hitting it straight on is another way, but mm -hmm. at least being aware and conscious about who do we want in our lives? Mm -hmm. I think is ever so important today because it's just the, the hustle that we're on and the dependency that we do have with each other mm -hmm. and just the whole concept of like loneliness and like that thirst for belonging. Mm. 
spending more time thinking about, okay, who am I hanging out with and how are they impacting how I show up is I think a really good exercise just to sort of think through from time, from time to time for, for anybody, regardless of what they happen to do in the world. Mm. Mm, definitely. Totally. It's, it's almost like you, we, we often speak about it. It's like you only have so much energy in a day. And if you're going to spend trying to make a relationship work or adding because you want to feel part of a friendship group or whatever it is, if you start to feel that feeling and it's not reciprocated, then, you know, then you just have to move on. And I've always struggled with that. I've always thought, okay, we were good friends. You have to be friends your whole life. You know what I mean? Like we have to make it, you know, stay in contact and, but you know what, you have friends that come and go and it's great and that's okay. You know, and that's, I think, um, a, like you said, it's a big lesson to, to learn. But um, Obi, you know, um, Gareth had mentioned as well that you'd been, you know, you've been super busy. You've been up to a lot uh, since we last spoke. And, uh, but you've also actually stopped a few things in your life. And uh, uh, you were mentioning friendships now, but you, um, you used to have like a weekly podcast with one of your friends and have since uh, stopped doing that. Um, how difficult was that decision uh, for you? Well, to, you know, I think the traditional answer that many of your listeners would expect would be like, oh, it was so difficult. And, you know, it was toing and froing and like the <laughs> wrestling, but it really wasn't. It was, it was really sort of cut and dry, relatively easy because the show was great while we had it but it no longer honored the values that I wanted to honor. Mm. And so when you can make decisions about what you do and what you don't do, because every no is a yes is a no, then the decisions get easier. I'm not going to say it was like easy, but it was certainly like easy peasy type of thing. You know, there was a little bit of to and from, but it was a relatively easy decision to say, Hey, you know what? When I, I'm not looking forward to this show each week. Like I was for the longest time, mm. but then it got to a point where it's like, ah, oh, you know, I'm not like the mojo ain't there. Mm. And, you know, I sat with that and I, I wondered why. And I also looked at the other things I wanted to do because the time, you know, I know you guys spend a lot of time on the show, but it fuels you up. It like invigorates you, you get energy from it, but that show, I just wasn't feeling it. And so it wasn't lifting me up. It was actually pulling me down. Mm. And once you spend some time thinking about that, you realize, oh, wow, like, and that's an easy decision to stop doing it. And free up some time to do other things that would excite me more, that could mm. bring out the best of me so I could be in a position to help more people. Now, the conversation with my partner around, hey, um, you know, I think sometimes people dread that because that's mm. a difficult conversation. Mm. But I tried to say, hey, let's let's have, you know, let's have an adult conversation about, are you getting excited about this? Are you, are you still excited? Here's where I'm at. And this is where I want to do. It's nothing against you. And it's not a reflection of our partnership. But this isn't fueling me up like I want it to. And so if I show up every week with like sort of a depressed energy, then I'm not, I'm not honoring our friendship and I'm not honoring our listeners. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's make a decision not to do it. So my, my wife, if you talk to my wife, she's like, she'll tell, she'll tell you, I have two superpowers. One is I got great people radar. So I can mm -hmm. meet someone pretty quickly and be like, all right, yeah, cool person. Like could fit into my Peloton or not. And I can quit things that don't serve me pretty easily. That's you know, good. so especially when it becomes like pop culture. So a few years ago, this goes actually more than a few years ago, like juicing became a thing, right? In the States. I'm mm. not sure about where you guys are. Everyone was juicing. Like they were just drinking juice for a whole week as a <laughs> cleanse. And like, and it wasn't like it wasn't like blueberry juice. It wasn't tasty juices. It was like like dried celery and yeah, dried <laughs> cucumber kale celery juice and it was like and, it, and then you would have these people that would just you know rave about it like oh, i feel so much better and just yeah 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 so i was like okay i'm gonna try this out so i signed up for this juice company it was gonna send me juice for seven days i was gonna do a seven days juice detox and i got like 36 hours into it and i was just like <laughs> 
I go, this sucks. I'm like, this is horrible. Like I wasn't enjoying the juice. I wasn't enjoying how I was feeling. I was lethargic. And I was like to my wife, I go, I'm done. I'm quitting. Right. So, and she's like, what, what about all the juice? I go, I don't know. We'll, we'll drink it on the side, you know, like, but I, you know, and so to me, I think, I think this is sometimes what Seth, I'm going to pull on a thread a bit, but Seth Godin talks about the dip, right? So when you're in this plateau and you're, you're like, and I wasn't necessarily in the plateau with that juice cleanse, but trying to understand, like, are you just going through the motions and like, is it, can, can you see the other side and does it energize you or not? Um, and so when I know that if I'm doing something that's not linking up with my values, then it's easier for me to quit it. Um, mm. I ho also happen to be really resilient just coming through my re re recovery. So I'm not a quitter, but I, I am a, I, I like to think I'm a smart quitter and I quit things that don't, yeah, just don't jazz me up. Mm. Yeah. There, there's so many lessons in there, like around communication. Communication is mm. so important, you know, and obviously doing it properly. Um, also having kind of the maturity to, to have that conversation. But, but I guess the one that, that stands out for me is being able to say no. And, and you obviously have a skill at this. Um, is there any advice you can give anybody like in terms of how and why to say no to things? Well, I would say it's got to start with where do you want to go? You know, like the, the vision forward, you know, Gareth, I know we joked a couple of weeks ago and how, like how I'm sort of like hating on the word journey, which, you know, which I will say, like you guys, you guys talk about your journey a lot on the show, which like I'm totally cool with because I, because <laughs> I know you guys and I know you have a purpose of where you're going, right? But it's become so commonplace today. And I think it's so commonplace with this thing that's absent is that people don't know where they want to go. Mm. You know, and it's in this whole spirit, like, every road will take you there if you don't know where you're going, but you may not like mm. where you end up. And so I'm big about, I love journeys. They're like, Hey, I'm a cyclist. I'm on a journey every day I get on my bike, mm -hmm. but you got to have a vision of like, Hey, where do you want to go? And also knowing your values, because those sort of serve as your compass, your, your good old fashioned GPS system, like Google mm. maps. So as we go forth and we do whatever we want to do, like, doing a podcast or being an entrepreneur, just being in corporate, you know, the corporate world, having some idea where we want to head on this journey of ours that we call life and career. And also knowing how we want that journey to go, I think is important. So when, as I make decisions, I always sort of go back to, Hey, what's my vision? What do I want to do? What's my purpose, if you will. And does this decision help me honor my values any better than maybe decision Y versus decision X. And that's where, that's where I begin on almost anything. So if it, if it doesn't do that, then it makes it easier for me to say no. Hmm. And then I work on how to let people down. Like, so, so a lot, sometimes clients, companies call me and say, Hey, we want you to do a talk. We want you to do a keynote or do coaching. And I've had to turn down the business, which, as an entrepreneur, it's like, Ooh, you know, mm. like oh, it's money. Like, you know, you're the yeah. provider for family, but what they're doing in the world just ain't my jam, like how they're doing it. And I'm mm. like, I go, this is going to sound crazy, but I'm going to say no. And they're like, you're going to say no. Like we're going to pay you. Like mm. we're going to pay you. Like forget about how much it is. We're going to pay you money to come <laughs> in and talk. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, I'm like, I got to say no. And, and, and I'll tell you why, like, like what you stand for and what I stand for doesn't jive hmm. and that's not in alignment hmm. because I'm a big believer, like live your life in alignment, your beliefs, your words, and your actions in alignment. That's when you have the best opportunity to manage your energy, just like a car, right? A car that's misaligned is hard to drive. It takes up takes more energy to drive it it's not fun it's not safe it's not all that jazz but when you have a car that's aligned it's fun to drive it same with people right so i i work on that alignment if if a business opportunity comes by and it doesn't align with how i want to show up in the world then i'll say no and you know it 
it could hurt a little bit, especially if they're going to pay you like, you know, gobs of money. So, or whatever gobs is, uh, but to me, it, having alignment is more important than the money. So, so as you mentioned, like the basis is actually having a, your compass is your, or are your values that you have to first know what those are and, and then work from a base from there. But I, just in terms of the example you use with your giving a talk, um, I, I've kind of wondered about this a lot is like your, you are in alignment, right? They might not be. Is it not a good thing then to go into the places that aren't just gelling with you that simply so that you can maybe make the shift or maybe inspire someone within that construct that might, you know, do you understand what I'm trying to say? Like, yeah, yeah. I've like always kind can, of wondered about that. Yeah. Like you could come in and then you can shift their perspective. Um, yeah, so but I'll, get, I'll give you an example that's like real world, real time. And I'm not going to mention the companies, but I'll give you like a real world example. So a company came to me, uh, the person, the person who came to me, his wife heard me talk at a different company, his, his wife's company. And she was like, you got to get Michael to speak to your company. So he called me up, said, Hey, we want you to come in and speak. So I learned two things about the company as I did research. One, there were a few members of their executive leadership team that I knew of that I didn't think had the, the same type of moral compass or ethical compass that I had. And it, that's not to say I'm right and they're wrong. It was just different, but it wasn't, there was no alignment, right? In terms of like, there was no Venn diagram of even overlap. And the company has some culpability in what the U.S. is dealing with, with the, um, basically our pain med addiction in this country, mm-hmm. where knowing the industry as I do, they knew things, this is my point of view, mm. that could have, they could have done more to get out in front of the issue. But by what's apparent is they chose to f- get the cash and which has led to um, thousands of people dying and mm. a national epidemic on with mm. pain meds and the way they're playing it out in the press suggests that they're doubling down on their righteousness. And so there's not even any openness to examining maybe different perspectives. Mm-hmm. So I, and, and so for me, like based on how I see it, and I will also say this is like where I sit, I don't have all the facts because we never have all the facts. Like we never, we can search all day long and I, you know, we can look at different perspectives until the cows come home. But based on where I sit, the facts that I see suggest that we're not in alignment and there's also a lack of openness. So mm-hmm. a company, another company could come to me and say, Hey, you know what? Where we are, you know, we're struggling and we see the world this way and we want you to come in because we're open to a new perspective, but we're struggling mm. with it. And so if, if I hear some of the openness, then certainly I will come in. Totally. But if I feel, and some of it's just feel, some of it's just like, you know, that the vibe or the energy you get yeah. from talking to someone, you're like, God, you are like, you're closed <laughs> off. <laughs> and, and I and again I say this saying like I'm not saying this I'm right and they're wrong because everyone has you know some validity to their view of the world mm. except for some people on the extreme which are just like their their currency is hatred and bigotry and all that jazz right but like the 97 other oh, percent yeah. of us right so they have a view of the world I have a view of the world and you know, we also have limited time. So do Mm. I want to spend one of my or multiple hours of my 168 during the week going to a company that I feel isn't open to really changing? And I just choose not to do that because Mm. there are so many other millions of people across the world, billions, who are open to change. And if I can spend my hours talking to them or reaching them, then that's where I want to play. And energetically, they get the most out of me and I get the most out of them. And hopefully that energy starts to cascade mm. and then we can change the world like one person at a time. 
Cool. I like that. That clarifies a lot. It's like find that that vibe is almost more important than what the nuts and bolts of what the business is doing sometimes. And if you if they're open and yeah, that's, that makes so much sense. Thanks for clarifying. So we also just have to say a massive congrats. Um, as uh, yeah, your daughter is, is off to college soon. Yeah, so that's pretty awesome. She got a tattoo today, guys. No way. Wow. Yeah. wow. So she's coming home for dinner. Like we're, you know, obviously the listeners don't know this, but it's like late afternoon in the States. And I just, before we got on, she sent the photo of the freshly inked tat. Oh, wow. So, um, yeah. So mom and dad do not have tattoos, but my <laughs> oldest daughter has a little one and, and my youngest Grady has a little bit bigger than one that my oldest has <laughs> and they're both meaningful to them and but it's so yeah we're gonna we're gonna scope it out when she comes home from dinner from the city so yeah so she's what are your thoughts on that tattoo um you know hey there's nothing more permanent than a tattoo so you better <laughs> you know if if you have a message you better love the message <laughs> so, um, my oldest daughter uh, she's really open about this, but so back, uh, she's got an excellent blog around just mental health. When she was in middle school, she dealt with self-harm, which is something that a lot of girls in, in middle school in their tween years or teenage years deal with. And, you know, I, I wrote this card to her. It had a cycling theme, you know, no surprise. <laughs> and it had a bunch of mountains on it. And then inside the card, it said, you know, pedal fast. And I wrote this card, and to, to be honest, guys, I don't know what I wrote, but the card meant so much to her. She sort of cherished it and kept it by her bedside. Mm. And so she came to me a few years ago. She's like, I want to get pedal fast on my wrist. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So she's coming and telling me the story, and I'll probably get choked up now. Like, I started bawling and stuff. I'm like, yeah, you can, yeah, sure, why not? Like, you know, <laughs> but you know, like, at that point in time, I would have, like, said, yeah, like, tattoo your whole body. I was, like, so emotionally, like, struck by her story. Yeah. Um, my youngest is a huge environmentalist, and she's just fascinated with sharks. Like, she, like, mm, she cool. thinks the shark is the coolest thing on the planet. Cool. And sharks are like wickedly cool. Yeah. And so, and for her, you know, she's old enough to vote here in the states. And her biggest topic is the environment because if we don't fix the environment, then every other topic doesn't even matter. Because if we don't have the planet, like, you know, nothing yeah. else really does matter. Mm -hmm. So, and she cares about the ocean, and she, she's a she's a vegan because of the environment and animal rights. So the a tattoo of a shark. And it's not a cartoonish shark. It's a pretty cool depiction of a, a shark drawing. Uh, that that means something to her. So yeah. as long as it has meaning and story, because hey, ultimately, we're all storytellers. Hopefully, we all are. That's how we we've learned across the years. And mm. so they have two things that are permanent um, <laughs> that will tell a great story. So um, <laughs> it's not it's not my cup of tea. I, I have my scars are my tattoos. So that's that's one way I tell my story. So I don't necessarily need to get ink on to tell a great story but um hey if, if it's your thing like i say go for it i think it's pretty cool yeah those are cool tattoos yeah, yeah they are cool they're cool it's good that they have meaning like you said as yeah. well and um we actually there's maybe two podcasts you can recommend to your daughter we we spoke to a guy called paul de gelder he was um uh, bitten by a shark or had his, had his leg ripped off and his uh, arm ripped off in uh, sydney harbor and his mm. story is really, really fascinating. So I can send you that. And then, then this lady called Emily Penn, she's massive into plastics and like takes lots of girls around the world on her ships to clean up the plastics and to research plastics. Oh, cool. Actually, she might even want to like get in touch with Emily because she, they run these expeditions around the world and, and are always looking for um, female crew and stuff. So, so yeah, but um, it sounds like you have uh, you've brought up an amazing family, and it's no surprise because you are just a just a really good bloke as oh, well yourself. You, so, thank you. Well, um, yeah, my wife and I are going to go into empty nest mode here in a few weeks. Yeah. So old oh, girls wow. off to college is like you're going to be lonely, wow. man. I know, it was, yeah, it's going <laughs> to be like holy cow! Like we could do like a, we can have a dinner that lasts more than like a half an hour. So it's gonna, <laughs> it's going to yeah. be kind of, it's like we are we're both excited about this new 
new phase of our life. You know, it's, you know, we're, we're ending a chapter of mm. our family it's life. big, yeah. You know, both girls are going off to college. Um, but, you know, I'm a big believer, and so is my wife, of, like, making sure the conversation is always open to talk about, like, how what do we need from each other at this point in our lives? Mm. And I think any relationship needs that, you know, because so many relationships can get so transactional of all the to-do stuff, especially mm. with kids about, you know, mm. school and after school and grocery lists and like all that stuff. Mm. So, you know, we've been talking through like, Hey, what do we want from each other? What do we want together as we, you know, start this new chapter of our life, which is pretty cool. Yeah, bud. That's so cool, man. Once again, so many lessons in there. And it just like comes down to communication. Everything is about <laughs> communication. Yes. You know what? Just get that right and kind of be open and honest with people. And you literally, you, you'll find that your sort of stress levels and your issues just reduce right down, I think. Um, so actually talking about, uh, you know, transitions and these sort of things, obviously you've, uh, transition from the corporate world to working for yourself and it's been over four years now I think um yeah. yeah so congratulations for doing that I mean I know initially you and your wife like you had a deal like you were like if this doesn't work out then I'll go back and unfortunately you never had to do that which is amazing and you're doing super well um is there like maybe you know two main pieces of advice you'd give for people that are looking to make that transition themselves from working in a corporate to going to working for themselves well one of them is back to conversation. So I think the most important conversation we have every day is the one that we have with ourselves. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times we talk about conversations with each other at work or in life and relationships. But that conversation that you have with yourself, especially as an entrepreneur, and if you're making that transition from corporate life to entrepreneurship, so key. And I, I made the transition, you know, at sort of the tender age of 47. So mm -hmm. you know, it's, you know, so I was at 27 and making like the hustle and grind switch. You know, I left behind a pretty lucrative corporate career with a whole bunch of perks for no paycheck, right? <laughs> you know, I was at one workshop a, a few years ago and he was like, oh, it must be easy to be an entrepreneur. And, I'm, <laughs> you know, and, I'm like, and he's like, you don't get it. You've been out of the corporate world too, too long. And I'm like, I was like, well, well, I'll do respect. I eat what I kill. And he was like, huh? I <laughs> said, well, in order for my family to eat, I have to go out and get business. Yeah. Like the paycheck doesn't come every other week. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's some great comfort in that. So, so having a healthy conversation with yourself is so critical to running, I think, any type of business. The other bit of advice I would give is get really clear on the type of people you want to help. You know, I wasn't really all that lasered in and you know if folks will take courses and stuff like that and there's always another course out there around niching or niching you know your business mm -hmm. and for a lot of entrepreneurs who don't have any business at all at the start they tend to cast in that way too wide mm -hmm. and it's scary to niche down on someone very specific you know thinking about that ideal customer and really identifying with them whether they're blogging or doing videos or podcasting or what have you, like how do we reach them? So that, that narrowing in on exactly who I wanna help in the beginning seems very scary because we want business, we'll take anybody. Mm. And I would say like work through that resistance and try to get more focus than it makes you comfortable. <laughs> in your yeah. um, and again, in the beginning, I was, I was fairly good at it, but I wasn't great at it. And over time, I've gotten better at it, you know, each year and each subsequent year. So getting really clear about who you want to help, why you want to help them, what are their pain points, and thinking about them as you put things out into the world, because mm -hmm. that's another bit. It's like so many entrepreneurs don't want to necessarily put themselves out there because mm -hmm. maybe someone might not like it. So it's <laughs> easier to sort of hold back and, and hide. But if you can think about, hey, there are people out there that need to hear what I have, you know, in store, then that's a great way of sort of getting above, uh, beyond ourselves and into service ship and helping other people. Uh, so that's, I think that's another piece. And then the third one that we sort of talked about is trying to have some idea of where you want 
to go on your journey as an entrepreneur? Like, what do you want out of your business? So this is my fifth year. And each year I sit down and I, and I, I map out like what, what I want. And it's not necessarily like revenue. I don't necessarily talk and think in, in terms of those terms, but more about, you know, what's the type of work I want to be doing? Who are the, who are the people I want to help? How do I want to help them? How do I want to reach them? what do I want to be busy on or active on? Uh, Cause I'm a big believer in like getting really specific on the things that truly matter and not getting out hustled on those things. Hmm. And then as we talked about earlier, just cutting the stuff that don't, that, that doesn't serve those things. Hmm. So I can get really specific, really purposeful, but I do have a long-term vision for each year. So I, I know, what this year's journey is going to be about. So I have that vision. I have my values as opposed to just like, you know, sort of spraying it, you know, and you know, spray and pray or like throwing the spaghetti on the wall. I'll be like, I'll just put it, do a whole bunch of different things or I'll, I'll take this course. I'll take that course. I'll do what that person is doing and try to replicate that. And that's not a really sound way of approaching your business. Mm. And, but I do see a lot of entrepreneurs doing it that way. Mm. Hmm. Great advice. It's so valuable. And and once again, it's like it all starts from within. It's like your your message is very strong on like knowing where you're at as a human being and what you what resonates with you and then projecting from there, not not the sort of looking out and finding answers in other things. And I think that's those are great lessons. And but but in terms of things that have made big differences in your life, um what what are what has made like the biggest difference uh, in terms of this journey for you know working with, of working with yourself or for yourself? Um, you've done things like Alt MBA, Lewis House uh, Houses Mastermind. Um, what are the things that stand out for you the most, and uh, in terms of getting to where you are now? Yeah, it's a great question, Craig. And going back to like what you just said, so I wasn't perfect in, with any of this in in the early days, and I would say I'm not perfect at it today. There are certainly moments where I compared my beginning to someone else's middle. Hmm. Be like, ah, oh, Seth, like, how does he have so many people following <laughs> him? And like, how do I go viral myself? I need to do like a pithy little Seth post, you know, like he'll have three sentences and everyone will be like, oh my God, this is genius. <laughs> and I'm like, I'll do three sentences and it'll be genius too. And, and it's not, it, it wasn't. Or, You'll see like, you know, Gary V or Tim Ferriss and be like, oh yeah, well, I got to be edgy, right? And I got to drop a few F-bombs and then that will gain. So like I did all that in the beginning and, and none of it worked. <laughs> so, none of it worked. But in terms of what, what did work was, I, I think a couple different things. So doing the Seth Godin Alt-MBA was uh, foundational to my success because I went in as a hesitant writer, like I had post-traumatic seventh grade English disorder. Like I never <laughs> fancy myself as a writer, but I started blogging because it was like, well, I guess entrepreneurs and coaches blog. So, you know, I was blogging, but I really, the big question I had going into the alt MBA was, should I write my memoir? And I had so many people around me say, you got to write, you got to write, you got to write. But they were all close to me and they were all biased. And I was like, I'm going to go into this group of creatives, of freelancers and entrepreneurs who don't know me. And I'm going to share my story with them. And if I get a good read, then I'll write my book. And I also wanted to figure out why I wanted to write my book. Because so many people said, you should write your book because it'll be great for your business and great for marketing. And I was like, yeah, I don't know if I want to do it for that reason. And Seth asked the question on module one, like, what is it for? And I was like, okay, what's this book for? And I realized the book was really for the message. It was for my daughters who were too young at the time, but also for everyone out there going through something that needs like maybe some inspiration just to help them get past it. That's relatable. That's not like Oprah magic, which, mm -hmm. and, hey, I love Oprah, but Oprah's version of success is so skewed to the right of the distribution curve i don't know if it's really it sometimes it's fleeting for a whole bunch of people because it's mm. like oh it's oprah right um so seth's all mba really helped birth my my memoir shift creating better tomorrows so that was key 
the Lewis Howes mastermind was valuable in this degree. It's like I joined and I was the old, one of the oldest people there. If I wasn't the oldest, I was the second oldest. And most of the people in this mastermind were online personalities. They had built these incredible businesses online and I was a brick and mortar corporate guy. So hmm. I felt out of place because I was older. I felt out of place because I wasn't a West Hollywood online guy. Right. Mm -hmm. I was just like this, you know, corporate guy. Mm -hmm. And they spoke one language and I was speaking a different language. Mm -hmm. And I saw incredible businesses, but I also saw a lot of other things that I didn't necessarily want. So for me, it really helped me one form some cool partnerships with some people that really like I jived with and they jive with me. But it also helped me understand like what I didn't want out of my business. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't want to create a whole massive empire that was like multiple seven figures. You know, I just, I, I think it's awesome that so many people in this mastermind do that and want to do that. Mm. But going through the experience, I realized, well, I don't want to do that. I want to have a different type of business mm. and where people get me and we have that connection. Um, but it, he also like through that, I learned about, membership sites like going in i didn't know anything about membership sites i learned it through lewis house's mastermind so ever forever grateful for that and also my new book is sort of modeled after his millionaire mornings so he talked about one of the books he wrote that was highly valuable to the reader and also instrumental in his business so mm. that that mastermind helped me under like it gave me exposure to new things from an online community uh, from a marketer point of view, but it also helped me understand like what I wanted my business to be about and be comfortable in my own skin. Um, and, and, and it was again, really cool that those guys had all that going on. But what I realized is that like, it's really cool that I got all the stuff that I have going mm. on and That's both good. and both can exist together. So, my book definitely instrumental because that led to speaking engagements and being able to reach more people. Um, and the Lewis Howes Mastermind helped me understand, like it gave me a chance to scale my business in a way that met sort of my alignment, but it also helped me understand what I really wanted my business to be about and forever grateful for both of those experiences. Mm. Yeah, for sure. I think, I think that's the, like, besides the obvious, like, uh, lessons they want, the, the, maybe the not so obvious one is when you do a course or, or whatever it is, you, you sometimes find out what you don't want to do. Mm -hmm. And, um, I like, yeah, it's, it, that's such an important lesson. I think, you know, sometimes it, it doesn't make sense and you like think, Oh, I'm wasting my time doing this, but what are the actual other reasons? What am I learning from, from doing this? So, yeah. um, so yeah, so but uh, how do you how do you like like keep yourself motivated every single day though as a solo kind of entrepreneur? Entrepreneur. <laughs> yes, no, that's okay. Well, I, and one and one thing I just want to add to the like, the last question is like I've met so many incredible people th through some of these courses. Like you know, like mm. like I, I, we're not we're not having this conversation if I don't take the all MBA. Yeah, exactly. Right. So. Like, that's the cool thing about those courses. If you lean into them, those communities, even if you don't necessarily get out of them what you think you're going to get out of them in the beginning, you have an ability to meet so, so many wickedly cool people. Mm. And to me, that's the biggest benefit, like having a group of people around you that can help you stay motivated, which is, you know, back to your question, Gareth, is one way I stay motivated. Is like I try to surround myself with people who think abundantly that want to make good in the world and you know some of it is a little bit of friendly competition be like hey what are those guys doing what like and it's not a comparison thing it's more about like iron sharpening iron like oh wow they're doing really cool things I'm like i'm motivated i'm gonna do really cool things too and you know it's not and it's a community like you know for with you guys like watching you guys do your thing and watching other people that we commonly know do really cool things you're like i want to do what they do mm -hmm. and it's not like we're trying to beat each other, right? Because we, we both have a place to stand in this world, which is really cool and um, awesome sauces, I would say. Mm -hmm. But it's like the, the people around me help inspire me. But I would say this at the core, you know, I can give the answer like, well, I'm a provider for my family and 
all that. And that's all true. But when I go out and someone reaches out to me and says like, your story is what I needed to hear today. Like when I put out my weekly uh, blog, my shift tip and they see the video, if they get it directly or they might see it on LinkedIn and they write me and said like, this was exactly the message I needed to hear today. Mm. Like that's like, I don't, I don't need much, but that, <laughs> that, that is like golden. Yeah. Like, mm. all right. That, that is like great mojo. Like I was like, yeah. right. That's cool. And people say like, I don't know what it's about you, but like, like every message that you deliver each week seems to be the message I need to hear this week. Mm, that cool. type of stuff. Um, that, that keeps me going. That keeps me pedaling, you know, cause I, <laughs> I do believe this. If you can change one life anywhere, you change lives everywhere. So if you reach one listener through your podcast or one viewer through my, my video blogging, then they're going to show up that day, maybe a bit different. And there's a ripple effect to that. And mm. the people that they ripple into or cascade into their lives change. And if we can do that on a more routine or consistent basis, then slowly but surely we change how we live together. Well, I also think that we will change how we work together because we back we spend so much time at work. Exactly, <laughs> totally. <laughs> just to do things as a team is is so valuable, and it just makes things just that much better. But I love how you say like, just that validation is. It's an interesting thing though, because if you feel validated in a in some way from from a someone writing to you or sending you a message. You don't necessarily do it for that, but it somehow is a fuel as well. It's this, this weird sort of juxtaposition, isn't it? Yeah, it is, you know, because it, it can be a, a little bit of a rabbit hole, Craig. You could go down and be mm. like, you know, it's the dopamine ego hit of mm. like, oh, wow, they liked it. Oh, they, you know, like, and then you start, you start thinking about doing things for likes and shares and <laughs> comments, you know, all to go like viral and, and beat the algorithms that Facebook and LinkedIn and, Mm. whatever social media platform seems to have. So for me, like each week, like, like today, I have a general idea of what the topic will be for Sunday, but I just let it sort of like sit out there and then whatever sort of pops up is what I, what I tend to write about in video and do a video about. And mm. so in those moments where it's like, I put it out there and it's like, that's the message that someone wants to hear. For me, that's like, wow, that's like crazy universe stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And to me, it's a reminder that we, although we don't all see each other, we all are connected. You know, we can, we can see something a half, half a planet away, whether it's happiness or sadness, you know, like a natural disaster or joy. And I can watch it here in New York and New Jersey and feel happiness and joy or sadness, you know, mm. that even though I'm not there and even though I don't know the people that are experiencing it halfway around the world. So when I put something out there and someone it resonates with someone, it's like, wow, like, you know, the planet, we're actually closer than we realize. Mm. And when we <laughs> think that way, then we can't help but show up that way. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's, you know, that's sort of the cool thing about it. It's one, one of the reasons why I do it. That's so cool. I guess when you're constantly saying this is who I am and affirming that you become more of that person for, to, to, you know, because you, that's who you want to be and who you're saying you are. And then it becomes more of that, which is, which is really cool. So Obi, you, you've been up to a lot, as we, we said earlier, and, um, you started your online program, the, the Paceline Leadership Academy. Uh, you're the, the first male president of the New York chapter. Uh, you've written your latest book, My Last Bad Day Shift. You're doing speaking gigs. You're a family man. You love to exercise. So where do you find the time to get all of this done? Well, that's, that's a question that I asked one of your former guests. Like, that's like, now the question is a lot easier to ask Craig than answer. So, <laughs> so, I thought it was quite a long question, to be honest, but no, uh, I like it. Like, so, <laughs> you're going through it and like, oh, wow, like there's a lot of stuff happening. Yeah, like, you know, I, 
so I get I get really particular about like being focused on the work at hand. Um, you know, some of those things that I do, you know, take they do take me a while. Like so, you know, you know, putting out like just like with your podcast, you know, folks don't know it, but you guys put a lot of hours behind the scenes to put out a podcast each mm. week or you know, the frequency that you guys are on now. And just even doing a blog and doing the video and posting things and stuff, it definitely takes some effort. So I get really particular with my time because that's that's the one resource that we do have a limit on. Like there's mm. no way to get any more than 168 hours. So I make sure I get my sleep. I get very specific about the type of workout and cycling I do so I can maximize my health and my fitness. I, if I'm going to be with my family, I want to be present with my family, which means that the phones are going away and I can just like connect with them. Mm. And I, and I go back to some of the principles that we talked about earlier, just like, well, what's the work that I want to do? You know, I thought about doing a podcast at the beginning of this year, just my own podcast. And I just wasn't feeling it. But what I felt more was writing my new book. And I was like, well, I'm going to put my energy into that and, and get really focused. And I know a lot of people talk about the Pomodoro technique of time mm. management. So I don't necessarily do that. You know, I've read research on both sides of the coin and all that's left me is a little bit fuzzy. <laughs> so, but I, but that concept of, <laughs> Hey, all right. I know, I know when I'm best in terms of writing. So I'm going to carve out the time during the day where I'm going to write the best. So if I was writing anything at like nine 30 at night, it would be rubbish. Mm. Mm. And so I tried to get, uh, I think Daniel Pink wrote a book and the title now escapes me, but it's all around the concept of when you do things. And I get pretty particular about when I do the things I do and making sure that I align the time when I'm at my best. So my workouts are best in the morning than say in the afternoon and I tend to write better in the morning than I do in the evening. And so in the afternoon, I save, you know, work for other stuff. And then in the evening, I, I do other things like family time and stuff like that. Mm. It's, it's so important to be like conscious of when you do your best work. And uh, yeah, I, I'm the kind of, I think I'm the exact same as you. I uh, prefer writing in the morning and I feel like it flows better in the morning as well. Um, and but it's also kind of amazing how that resilience is still there sometimes and you like you then you won't do it and then it'll come the afternoon and you'll you'll do it and it'll be like a sort of half effort which uh which always kind of sucks so that there's also that kind of training when it comes to that as well but um but actually yeah just before we we discuss uh, your your book in more detail um and you're just talking now about the posts that you're doing and the writing that you're doing I don't know if it's maybe just me, but one of the messages which seems to be coming across is like this kind of new age masculinity that you kind of uh, are speaking about and, and portraying. Like, what does that actually really mean and, and why is it important? Well, I think it's important because I think we're living through an incredible era with Time's Up and Me Too. And it feels, you know, for some people, it feels wonky or choppy and confusing because we're living through it right now and i and i do think whether we want to call it the current political climate or who might be in our white house here in the states but i think there are certain catalysts that are and, and it's just not one you know but certain catalysts that have sparked this to come up and for us to have greater awareness around you know the opportunities that we give to women uh, what it means to be a, 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 a male today, a guy today, uh, equal opportunity for people, diversity on many fronts. Like we're, it's all coming together. And I think the internet's definitely helped us out to say, hey, like, oh yeah, like before I just thought I was like the only one. Now I can like go online and see I'm not the only one. There are people yeah. like me. And so now this is all coming together through social media and in our conference rooms and in our in our, our kitchen tables, in our communities, and it it's all new. And mm. it feels, for some, it feels scary. Mm. For some, it feels like invigorating and it's messy. And, you know, for me, 
you know, I'm the byproduct of some great female mentorship throughout my career. And I also, you know, got involved because I wanted, I wanted a better world for my daughters. Hmm. My daughters who are just as competent as the guys they go to school with, when they become professionals and they go out in the workforce, they should get paid what another competent guy gets paid. Mm -hmm. To me, that's like a no brainer. And for every company out there, they can make that change happen like today. Yeah. Right. It, that, that doesn't need more analysis. It just needs the courage to make the damn decision. Mm. And so when I joined the healthcare business women's association, because that's an advocacy group within healthcare, really trying to promote gender parity, which is a big umbrella topic, but equal pay opportunities, uh, value and diversity. I did it when the girls were really young because I wanted a different world. Now they're 18 and 21 and the world hasn't changed as much as it needs to change. Mm -hmm. And now we're in this meet two times up era that I think it's ever so important for guys also to step into the conversation. And, and for us as like white guys, like from, I'll just sort of speak for myself here in the States, like I never really found myself in the minority. Mm. And empathy is so critical now to help bring our communities together so we can listen to connect with each other that joining organizations like the Healthcare Business Women's Association or being in situations where you're in the minority so you can feel what it feels like to be in the minority then maybe that helps you show up a little bit differently and ask a better question and have a better dialogue because I do see a lot of guys during this era sort of like oh god this is scary I don't know what I should do I'll, I, I will you know I've heard guys say well maybe I shouldn't have one-on-one -on -one, uh one-on-one meetings with my female direct reports maybe I should do it out in the open what and you know and, and they're never going to mention this in a corporate workshop Mm. But they're mentioning after maybe a couple glasses of wine as the guys sort of go off and talk after a dinner party and the women go off and talk after a dinner party. And, and so they just don't know what to do. So what they're doing is sort of retreating from the conversation that we need to have mm -hmm. because we need to get men involved in the conversation and women involved and people of all color and all backgrounds and all perspectives because today's problems demand diversity because they're more challenging than ever before. And the world is flat in so many ways because of mm. like how we live now. <laughs> and, and so for me, I think it's important to sort of think through like, what does it mean to be a guy? You know, back in the day, I thought the guy was the provider, the guy was the dad. And I really felt I had to be Superman at home and Superman at work. Because I was living through like old sort of old paradigms or mm -hmm. old belief systems. And I was living that way, but I was also pouring a whole bunch of stress inside of me. And like I like to say that SUV literally and figuratively knocked all that like mojo out of my body <laughs> because I was just pouring it in and pouring it in and I wasn't releasing it because I had no idea how to release it. I didn't so I was just repressing it. And after a while that just bubbles up and it that's not a good outcome. So I think today we're, we're living through something that's, I think, spectacular, although can be frightening because mm. we don't know, we don't know where it's going to go. But I do know is that if we all lean in and have a conversation, what it means to be a man today, how can we work with our female colleagues and not be their rescuers? You know, women don't need to be rescued. You know, sometimes mm. they just, they need the, for us to get out of their own, you know, for us to get out of their way. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, mm. um, but what does it mean to be a, a male ally at work or a sponsor, an advocate, a partner? How do we have better conversations, not only between men and women, but just across the board? I think it's an incredible time. And I think if our generation, you know, sort of like Gen X, maybe some of the younger baby boomers, even the millennials that are coming up, if we can have a better conversation at work, we can change work for future generations. And as I mentioned earlier, if we change how we work together, I feel very confident that we're gonna change how we live together because we mm -hmm. are spending so much time at work. Totally. I guess, you know, from my perspective, it can be, I can understand why it's tough and confusing for some people because on the one hand, you're celebrating your masculinity and your 
you know, that, that, that's an important aspect. But on the other hand, you're also sort of being told, no, we're all equal. There are no, a lot of these gender differences, et cetera, aren't really real. And I, and I think, it, I suppose it's good that we, at the end of the day, as you mentioned, Obi, is it's the, the communication. So when things are a bit messy and a bit tough, you, you, people tend to step back and, and, but you're still having the conversation actually with your, like you say, with your mate or someone else. So we just need to be able to lean in and, and discuss these things. But I do get like how, how these, like you said, these transitory periods can be quite confusing. You've got these Jordan Petersons and you've got these strong voices on, on different ends of the spectrum. And it must be quite confusing to be a youngster, especially, I mean, for me even, I mean, for anybody, I suppose, just to, to navigate all of that. I think it's, yeah, I think it's really, it really is confusing. And if, many of the guys today, they didn't necessarily create the problems of the past, mm. you know, because they weren't, they, they weren't around. Mm. But we do have a responsibility to work on making it better. Yeah, so we didn't spill the milk, but you know what, we're responsible for cleaning it up, at least part, part of the way, like, you know, again, not to make it up, like the guy has to do it all, like, it, like mm. together, we do it. Um, mm. Having that responsibility or accountability. And I think it's very possible we can have multiple definitions of what it means to be a guy. Mm. You know, and it, where in the past, there was probably like one dominant view of what it means to be a man. And now I think we, we can form different definitions and, you know, and those definitions can exist, you know, as long as there's like, you know, the misogyny is not there and the sexism isn't there. And like, mm. like that definition of a guy that's, you know, you know, there are guys out there that, that believe in that, and, you know, that's, you know, that's the fringe and start talking about more in the center. Like, like we can have, you know, that real, you know, sort of macho masculine muscle guy. And we can have like, you know, one that's, you know, a uh, house husband and mm. in all points in between. And I think we can come up with a lot of different definitions and we can have space for that. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we can also evolve like what it means to be, you know, a woman today, you know, gay and lesbian today in Africa, like, like across the board, I think we could have, you know, multiple, multiple definitions instead of just like putting everyone in a box, mm -hmm. you know, like here in the States, it's like, well, if you're African, African American, you're a Democrat, mm. but you know, there are African Americans who are conservative, right? So yeah. and, and they should, be, they should have space to be who they want to be totally. um, and not fit some stereotype. Yeah. Um, and I, I, but again, I think it goes back to, you know, what kind of conversations are we having? Are we talking with each other or are we just sort of talking at each other or about each other? Mm -hmm. yeah, that's very true. So, um, Obi, we spoke uh, about um, that you've written a book and a workbook or a toolkit called My Last Bad Day Shift. Now, how did that come about and how can, and, and can you give us maybe a brief overview before we discuss it a little bit more uh, in a little bit more detail? Well, yeah. So one, I have to say, there's got a great blurb in it by Gareth. So, uh, <laughs> when, you open, when you open it up, that's the first thing you see. So that's not sweet. Like, you don't have to read any further than that. <laughs> no, you definitely <laughs> do. <laughs> you put it down. So, so how it came to be was as I was doing my talks and I would talk about July 11th being my last bad day. So many people came up to me after and said, hey, you know what? My last bad day was this, and this is what happened. Hmm. And then I started realizing like, wow, like a whole bunch of people have their own version of their last bad day. Hmm. Now, n they're not all horrific, like getting hit by an SUV or maybe a, you know, a cancer diagnosis that doesn't look good, but they overcame it. Those, those can be those moments. For me, like the last bad day is that day where you decide you're gonna live life differently you're going to live life, you know, with a new script and not the script that you think society wants you to live by. So what I started realizing is that there's a whole bunch of people with these awesome inspirational stories, people like us that we see in our grocery store, we see at school, we just don't know, necessarily know their story. And there is, they're as inspirational as any other story out there on the internet. 
And I started thinking about like, wow, you know, my, my last bad day turned 18 a few weeks ago. And I was like, well, what can I do to like really celebrate that? You know, like that 18 year mark, hmm. because the doctor is basically pain in my life it, with dependency and limitations and more pain and suffering. So they never expected that I would turn out the way I turned out. And so let's do something really big. And I love doing things on the date of the anniversary just to sort of celebrate life. Mm. So I got that feedback from a lot of people after my talks, but I also got a lot of feedback from people like, well, in your memoir, you talk about like what you did and 20 ways of being, but you didn't talk about like how you do it. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was like, well, let's put together something relatively concise, more of a how to that's really practical, that's relatable, that's not woo woo and too hippy dippy and too out there and no hacks. Like it was, this is hackless. <laughs> no, this is just like good old fashioned practical advice to help, you know, help someone prevent a bad moment from turning into a bad day. And what I read, you know, a few weeks ago was that the people, there was this, uh, like a fitness app, they did a survey uh, with a whole bunch of people, I think over 2000. And the, cert the, the study basically concluded that people on average have 60 bad days a year. Hmm. And, it, and it all starts with like from a bad moment. Like it could be like a unexpectedly long commute or a bad meeting or maybe a bad conversation with a partner. The, the, the moment doesn't last long, but it just hijacks us. And then mm -hmm. it creates a bad day. And then that bad day can cascade into another day. And mm -hmm. all of a sudden, now we're living a whole bunch of like meh days. Like they're like, they're okay. Yeah. I wouldn't call them bad, but they're not great. We're sort of just living life. And all that can be prevented if we become more aware about how we're showing up. And when a bad moment happens, we don't give it any more fuel than it deserves. So it doesn't ripple in or hijack into a bad day. So that's sort of how it began to say, hey, like there's a whole bunch of wonderful people out there with last bad day stories. And how do we recruit more of these stories in? So one of the things I have planned for the rest of the year is creating a portal for everyone that has a last bad day story to share it. So mm -hmm. now people can go and see all these wonderful people with last bad day stories of grit and tenacity and resilience and how they overcame so we can lessen our our dependency on celebrity for inspiration. Mm -hmm. And again, I, I love, I have all my celebrity stuff on. I love all my celebrity inspirational stories and I love them. And I, I, I like cry emotions of like, that's awesome. And I love it. But I also do think that many of those stories are so over the top that people just don't know where to begin. And we need mm -hmm. other stories that are people like us yeah. coming together where we like, Hey, if Bob down the block can do it, I can do it. Yeah. Right? Totally. I can do that. And so I'm going to work on that as well. But the book is part of this whole initiative to help a million people have their last bad day. That's really Beautiful. cool, bud. Yeah. It's really great. I, lo I love that. Uh, the, this, the initiative of getting more people, normal people, I guess, like, like us to, to talk about their last bad days, because you know what? I think so many people do, look for inspiration and they, they think that it needs to come from like these, you know, um, you know, influencers or who, celebrities or whatever, but actually it's the people that are generally like closer to you in your own circle, which if you started speaking to them a little bit more, you'd find a lot of inspiration just from who they are and what they've done. And, um, that's such a good lesson for everybody. Actually, like you, we're surrounded by, uh, people and friends and colleagues with amazing stories and we just need to find out a little bit more about them and uh, and we'll find that that inspiration right there um so so it's really cool that you're doing that and um i look forward to reading some of those people's stories uh, so so talking about uh, the the book um it's it is really awesome i highly recommend uh, anybody that's out there to actually go there if you're looking you can see it there Obi is showing it to us <laughs> and like you said Obi, it's like it's super practical. There's no woo-woo stuff in there. It's, um, it's really, really, really helpful and provides a ton of value. So um, the questions you ask, how you've laid it out, all these things are, are super awesome. 
Um, and you've got nine chapters and you discuss things around mindset, energy management, routines, rituals, habits, um, you know, reflection and money and these things all really important things that we all kind of think about and, and, and suffer from and, and need and all these sort of things. Um, and I, I really like the first chapter where you talk about mindset and then limiting beliefs. And so many people have these limiting beliefs which really hold us back. Uh, so, so maybe you can just tell us a little bit about like, you know, I guess maybe the, the, the top few that you find and uh, are there like uh, any reasons or themes in all the people you've helped in, in your life, like why they have these limiting beliefs? Well, so yeah, I think limiting beliefs are, I think it's a common human tendency or behavior. And it's, I think it's all there to protect us, you know, cause it, it gets scary to, get outside that comfort zone because you know we, we want we want to feel safe and we want to feel belong you know we, like we belong to something you're going to you know whether Maslow w was correct in everything that he researched and, and published but once we get you know done with water food shelter and, and air we, we want safety and belonging mm -hmm. so as we try to level up as Seth would say or just like you know change or get through the resistance like Stephen Pressfield like going th going through that is scary because it no longer feels safe and so we have these programs in our head if you want to call them programs or just beliefs from maybe when we were younger like I referenced seventh grade English you know all the all the term papers I wrote that <laughs> didn't get great grades you know that over time I just developed a belief that I just wasn't good at that hmm. so the whole concept of like becoming an author like someone would want to read that my seventh grade english teacher didn't even want to read my stuff and he was paid to read my stuff and grade it so <laughs> like some stranger's going to read my story but that's ridiculous yeah. and it's all there to say hey don't do that because if you put yourself out there you're going to expose yourself to a whole bunch of judgment and different conversations that may not be pleasant so it's better to like just like lean back and just do what you're doing do what you've always done. It feels safer that way, at least in the mm. short in the short run. So I think these limiting beliefs sort of pop up in like all stages in our lives. And yeah, we can go back to when we were younger. Uh, we can go back to powerful moments, even as you look at you know, like more current current day, like 2008 here in the States, it actually across, across the globe, a whole bunch of people lost their jobs you know, in 2007 mm. and eight, you know, through the financial crisis. And that was a hard, that was a hard recession to get out up from. Mm. And there was a lot of self doubt that I think got planted back then. Now, mm. luckily in the States, we've had economic growth since that point, but we we start to hear conversations in the news about is the next recession coming. And you start to hear like different things like, you know, our company's ready for the next recession. Mm. And, when those stories pop out, some of that, some of that doubt that might have been dormant, that may have been in the back burner with some people that's really struggled through the last recession starts to percolate up. Mm -hmm. We don't share that in company workshops, but mm -hmm. we definitely worry about it privately or we have anxiety about it. And then it starts to influence how we show up because emotions drive behavior. Mm -hmm. And we're like, oh, are we doing everything that we need to be doing? Like, what should I be doing? Like, I don't know what I should be doing. And then we get, we just get swirling. Totally. And, and I think that's, I think that's something that's going to be very interesting to see globally, but also here in the States in terms of, you know, is, you know, w when the next economic recession comes, because it will eventually come, you know, how do we deal with it? You know, are we, who is resilient out there? Who's, who has the tenacity, who has the grit to get back up again if they get knocked back down? Because the last time we got knocked back down, knocked down that was a pretty powerful knockdown. Mm. Mm. And real success comes from when we get knocked down or we have this limiting belief, how do we change the conversation that we're having with ourselves and chunking down the problem and trying to take any step forward that can get, give us some momentum and making sure that we have the right people around us that can support us as we go forward. Cause that's another way of helping when we don't have the right 
we're, we're not, when we're not having the right conversation that we need to have with ourselves. Mm -hmm. For sure. Mm -hmm. It's so powerful that we, we do have knee jerk reactions. We do have old wounds that can be triggered. So the people that are around us, the language they're using, the kinds of things we're hearing do count because it, we're all, we, none of us are totally immune to that inner critic that can be sparked by, by certain words that you're hearing. So yeah, it's just such a, such a good reminder. Um, what, another thing that really resonates uh, massively with us is the, is sort of energy management. And we sort of touched on it a little bit earlier and you attribute um, it to five key things. Um, what are they and how can we uh, be better at those, Obi? Yeah, so I really like, so I studied energy management through my recovery. And I didn't necessarily have the vocabulary for it, but I just knew that, you know, energy was like something that we all need. Like as an athlete, you know, like you need energy, you need, like you need calories, right? So that in the one way, like, calories in help you like move it forward and back when i was you know just just injured when my last bad day was happening the whole concept of work-life balance was starting to percolate up it was still relatively new but what i noticed as i came back to my corporate life from my accident is that when people talked about work-life balance what we were missing was the core issue is that we felt drained, we felt tired. And what we were doing was spending all of our energy at work and then we'd bring nothing home but energy leftovers to the people we loved the most. Mm -hmm. And then we would spend the, the remaining, the dregs of our energy on the weekends doing more work. So what companies did, they put Band-Aids on the problem. They started doing different tactics. Well, we can have summer Fridays or you know, casual work or flexible work hours or like all these different tactics, but they didn't necessarily talk about the core of like what drives energy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as we mentioned earlier, when we don't have alignment, then we, we don't have a very efficient energetic system. So the five, the five areas in, in particular that I, I uh, punch out in the book are like one is spirituality, which is not religious. It's more about like, you know, do I feel good about what I'm doing? Do I have an understanding of like, you know, what I want to spend my time on? I talk about mental or emotional. So that's sort of like mind clutter, you know, and, and mm. focus. Um, so I talk about our physical health. That was one that, heck, I totally took for granted. Like mm. as a 33 year old, that's how old I was at the time of my accident. I was like, I I'm healthy. Like, you know, I used to think as foolish as this sounds right now, like, oh, bad things happen to other people. Bad things mm. don't happen to me. Like mm. I got my health until I didn't have my health. And I was like, mm -hmm. wow, health, health becomes in terms of your energy. When, when you feel sick, when even when you have a common cold, it zaps your energy. So how are you showing up each day in terms of promoting your wellness? You know, your, your nice. physical, your cardiovascular, all that, you know? So another part of it is relationships, right? So do you have the right relationships in your life? that can maximize your energy? Or are you hanging out with like Eeyore all day long? <laughs> right? So I have a, you guys can't see it, but I have a little picture of the Winnie the Pooh characters. I'm a big Winnie the Pooh fan. <laughs> so if you hung out with like 10 Eeyores all day long, your energy <laughs> is going to be zapped. Yeah. So the relationships you have are important in terms of how much energy you have at work or in your life. And then the last one is financial. You know, because, you know, money, money is basically, it's a story. We all have a purpose for our money. You know, some people use it to count and to compete, but a lot of people use their money for a lot of different stories, you know, a provider, giving, saving. Um, so understanding like what our money is for, because when we don't have the money that we desire, or we don't necessarily have alignment in terms of how we're thinking about our money, gosh, that can really zap us. The worry, mm. the anxiety of like, do I have enough money? Will I pay, how will I pay the bills next month? Mm. So those five areas, I think are five key areas. And in the book, I offer the reader about three or four questions in each section to sort of just, hey, look, let's think about where you are in these five areas and how you are overall to get a good handle on like, what's, what's pushing you forward energetically 
and what's pulling you back or serving as an anchor. Mm. Yeah, it's a, it's a very powerful and it's amazing what happens when you like, you know, you answer those questions that you've asked and it's uh, it's also a really interesting observation to see if you're doing those things properly that they kind of, I guess, lift your energy, but if you're not doing them properly, they're really sapping your energy and um, having that awareness is, is really, really important. Um, what, one of the other things we talk about in the book is, uh, is changing how, how we work or you work. And uh, one thing that actually really stood out for me, which I think is actually so important in this busy day and age where it's just like, go, go, go. Everyone's chasing kind of that next big thing is to actually add into your daily routine uh, to give yourself time to think. Yeah. And it's just such an important thing that we don't do enough of it, do we? We do. We really don't. We, uh, so that in that section, I call it self-care. And that was what the, my blog Sunday was on just the, you know, self-care. Cause it, what happened right before the book came out, I was burning the candle at both ends. I was not practicing what I was preaching mm -hmm. and I was drained. I wasn't sleeping well. My immune system was compromised and I caught a nasty cold and, and I was out for the count. Like that Sunday I slept for 15 hours hmm. and, and, you know, and, and, and I was doing something, I was recovering, but it didn't have to be that way. So if we just take a little bit of time each day, just to have a meeting with ourselves, just to think, just to breathe mm -hmm. and like decompress and, and maybe renew our energy and just think clearly, like we're making big decisions at work. We're making big decisions in life and none of our great decisions were done in a reactive fashion. Mm -hmm. They're all done with a little bit of thoughtfulness, a little mm -hmm. bit of mindfulness, but what happens so often, you know, I see it in the States. I know you guys see it where you are is, we go from meeting to meeting to meeting, like the hamster wheel concept of like eight to nine, nine to 10, 10 to 11, boom, 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 boom. We eat it, <laughs> we eat on the run if we eat it all. Mm. We're chasing it with caffeine. And then, you know, we might chase it with a glass of vino at night. And we're just, we're not really investing in ourselves. We're not investing in our own wellness. And if we're not, if we're not showing up that great, then we can't be great for the people around us. So I think one of the most important things a leader can do, actually it doesn't have to be like leader in terms of the hierarchy, just people in general is just schedule like 30 minutes to an hour of time just to like just think mm -hmm. and to be and to breathe, mm -hmm. you know, during the course of the day. And so many people say, well, I don't have time for that. And I'm like, oh, I go, but, but if, but if something happens, then you're going to be forced into it. You know, it's the whole yeah. concept that we never have time to prevent a fire, but we always have time to put out the 11th yeah. hour fire. <laughs> right. So, yeah. you know, like we don't want to do the prevention, but like something catastrophic happens, yeah. then we drop everything to deal with what's catastrophic and it's crazy. So we have the time. We're just not choosing to spend our time on the things that truly matter. Because we're we're busy on this all this some of this other stuff that isn't necessarily driving our joy and happiness or success. Mm -hmm. So it's getting really clear on okay, where do I want to go? How do I want to do it? The values that we talked about, and what 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 do I want to prioritize? Mm -hmm. And self care has to be a priority, especially in today's age, because we are going and we are working more than ever before. Mm -hmm. And if we're always we're always at the red line then bad moments can like cascade into bad days pretty easily because our our fuse is so so short mm. and so 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 much easier to get hijacked it's so interesting talking about self-care like there's so many like tooth or teeth brushing analogies that i've always used in my life but you know you you brush your teeth every day preventatively knowing that you don't just brush your teeth because your teeth are sore you do it to try and you know and but that's just become normal so like surely we could make other things normal that you you will just make part of your day that like you say that can that you know are doing the good down down the track and i'm pretty sure you can find time to brush your teeth and you can find make the time because it's part of your routine to do other things like that and i loved what with your video you spoke about you know i am doing something today i'm recovering it's it's not yeah. I'm lying on the couch doing nothing. And I think that's the guilt factor that so many people get. 
Well, I'm not sure if you saw it, Craig, but when the one person on Facebook responded to that and she goes, I feel guilty if I'm not doing something. Hmm. And, and when I shared with them, it's like, well, that's, that's a shift in perspective. Mm -hmm. yeah. When I was talking to my friend, she was, you know, I, I shared with her. Yeah. Like I was down for the count. I slept for 15 hours Sunday. She goes, well, it must've been nice not to do anything all day long. Right. So she said it with a mm. little bit of like, you know, Smart. friendly. it was a, it was a little snarky, but it was friendly because we're friends. And she was like, yeah. start teasing me. And I was like, well, actually, I was doing something. I was recovering. Mm -hmm. And what I know you guys know as athletes and your listeners know, it's like, you know, stress as an athlete will make you sweat, right? So stress makes us, you know, like get, it gets us outside of our comfort zone. But what makes us stronger, what makes us faster is our recovery. Mm -hmm. And you cannot get faster without recovery. Hmm. So, yeah, sweat all day long you know, hustle, mm. if you will, but we gotta, we gotta recover as, as fiercely or as strongly as we hustle. If not, then that's just like a one way street towards burnout and making poor decisions. And what I shared in the blog, like getting sick, like I got sick mm. and you know, when I got sick and I was sleeping, sleeping for 15 hours, yes, I was recovering, but the opportunity cost was, I wasn't doing some other things that did matter. Like I had to put those on the back burner mm -hmm. and this all could have been prevented if I was a little bit more conscious about how I was spending my time getting ready for my book launch and my travel and like just what I was eating on the road and my sleep patterns and all that mm -hmm. stuff like that. I, I could have, I could have minimized the impact of the head cold, but I was sort of burning it on both ends and, you know, again, as I mentioned earlier, I wasn't practicing what I preach. So I share <laughs> all the stuff I share, uh, not as a perfectionist, but as someone who's trying to <laughs> like take a step towards mastery each day that I get to, you know, get a crack at it. Mm -hmm. Cool, man. <laughs> so, you know, we, we've spoken about so many amazing things today. And, and one of the things that we think about a lot, but we don't often maybe talk about it in, is money. And money is obviously so important. But you had a tough experience where you had to ask your dad for for some mon for some money, uh, and then also take a loan out against your house. Um, how did that go down? That was so embarrassing. Oh, so it was like the worst. So I hit rock bottom when one of my friends invited me over to watch. I was living in Washington D.C., so it was a uh, Sunday, and we were watching football, the American type of football. Uh, not the European football. So he was like, come on over. And, you know, he was like, you know, when you come over, bring some beer and some snacks and stuff like that. So I went to the bank with my ATM card and I couldn't get any money out. I had like $3 and 14 cents in my bank account oh. and payday wasn't until that was a Sunday morning. Payday wasn't until Tuesday and my credit cards had been maxed. Because in my early professional life, I couldn't handle, I was in commission sales. So I couldn't, ha I couldn't deal or I didn't deal well with the ebb and flow. Some months I made like money hand over fist and some mm -hmm. months were like rather rough. But I kept my lifestyle, you know, close to money hand over fist. Yeah. So I was living that lifestyle, like going out and you know buying your drinks and like going to dinners and doing all that because I thought, Oh, wow, like a couple of good months, all the months are going to be like this. So when the months weren't like that, I just used my credit cards. And so my credit cards were maxed out. So the only mm -hmm. card I had left was a Sunoco gas card. <laughs> and I went to get gas. And I also went in to like buy some beer at the mini mark and some chips. But I only had enough money for the gas. Oh, like no. that card was maxed out. Oh, and so man. here I am. So I canceled out my friend because I was at that point, I hit bottom. I was so embarrassed. So I went home. And the next day I had to call my dad to say, hey, I've maxed out all my credit cards. I'm, I don't have a lot of money in the bank. Um, I need a loan. So he took out a home equity loan on our house that we grew up in. And he gave me the check. He was like, you got to rip up the credit cards. I'm like, I'm ripping the credit cards up. And so we paid, we paid off the credit cards. And then 
that was one of those rock bottom moments where I had to get really smart about my money really quickly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it had some like long-term impact. I remember meeting my wife like a few months later and, you know, I was still sort of paying my dad off and she was like, what's going on with that? Like, she, she, cause she really wanted a guy who had his bed off the ground and, and my financial troubles did not suggest that I was really a responsible adult yet. And she was like, well, you know, if we're going to have like a long-term relationship and maybe get married, I want you to be like financially sound. And I'm like, I am, I am. And she's like, no, you're not. Like <laughs> a little bit in denial. So <laughs> that was, that was a big moment for me to get really smart about what I wanted my money for and how to be smarter with my money and live a little, a notch or two below my means. Mm. And also get into a concept of like, I'm going to pay myself first, which has become popular nowadays. There's some really great books. There's one book called The Latte Factor and some others that are out there. The whole concept of like paying yourself first. So where once I was a spender and you know li living high mm. off the hog, as we say, mm -hmm. I became more of a saver and started just, you know, pushing money off to the side, paying myself first in the different type of financial instruments we had in the States, like the 401k or just investments. And that, you know, little by little, it wasn't a lot of money, but little by little over time made such a remarkable difference. And since that day, I've never had any type of debt whatsoever. So, and you know, I, no more credit card debt and really just sort of debt free and living a debt free life. And if I can't afford something, um, I don't buy it. You know, I, I save my pennies until I can. And, and when you say debt free, did that include your, your house, like the house you own? Is so that, that, do you count yeah. that as a <clears throat> Well, so I didn't count that at the time, but we had an opportunity as I started growing my career and I got into executive leadership and then I was making more, more money each year than I ever thought I would make coming out of college. Hmm. And because that wasn't part of the script, like to go as, <laughs> as high as I, as I did, I, we had an opportunity to pay off the house and my wife and I sat down and had a conversation. I go, it's important that we pay off the house. Now paying off the house for me was instrumental because it gave us ultimate freedom. Mm. Cause now mm. then we took all the money that we were using for our mortgage and we just started investing it and investing it, investing it. But more importantly, as I began my business, I didn't have, mm. I didn't have any bills to pay. So then I could really work on my business. And, mm. and I think that's the thing if for people out there going back to one of our first topics is that if you are in corporate, the corporate world and you're thinking about becoming an entrepreneur one day, whether it's coaching or something else, is that use this time now to try to get your financial house in order when you do make this shift. So to give you a little bit more breathing room so you can play the long game. Because mm -hmm. what I see happening, again, a lot is that people leave corporate, start their entrepreneurial journey, and they want business right away. And they start to make decisions in a very reactive way mm -hmm. that don't fit their long-term vision or their long-term journey. So I spent the time between the moment I knew I would get into executive coaching and speaking to the moment I did trying to build up my credentials but also building up my financial health so when we made the move i had just a little bit more of a cushion to play with so i could play the longer game a little bit longer hmm. and i'm so i'm so grateful that we did it that way yeah for sure, sure. That, that, that's exact that's literally um the best advice you can give anybody seriously like save up more cash before you take that leap so that you don't need to make desperate decisions, like literally, because then you just start doing things that you don't really want to do. And, and that's not, and, and then it's another spiral down another sort of, uh, you know, sort of path. And then that's not a good place to be. Um, Obi, I'm just really conscious of the time. Um, do, do you have 10 more minutes or is, yeah, that, is that too sure, much? Do, do, no, do you mind? I'm good. We're okay, cool. Like right, the, time, the time goes by quickly. So yeah, yeah, no, that, that's cool. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. We, we only have a few more questions anyway, like that. We, we just like to just to finish off with. So um, 
other things that you talk about are like habits and rituals and, and that these things are important. And rather than like maybe talk about the practicalities of them, maybe you can tell us like what, what, what sort of practices do you have in terms of your daily routines, um, morning and possibly evening? Yeah, so there's two good bookends and I talk about them in the book. So one, I never sleep with my phone. Mm. My phone always sleeps in another room. Now I know this isn't necessarily practical for some. It's actually not practical for my wife because she's a childbirth doula. So people are going to call her on her cell phone. But the reason why I suggest not sleeping next to your phone is this, that what I find happening is a lot of people, they wake up to their phone because it's their alarm clock. And the first thing they check before they actually get out of bed is they get into their email or they get into their social. And what that does mm -hmm. is before you can wipe the sleep from your eyes, before you can even go to the bathroom, your day is framed in all the things that you missed. Uh, and like everything you missed, all the FOMO totally. and all the things you need to do. So now like, it's like you're not even out of bed and you're on your hamster wheel. And you haven't even thought about like, well, how do I want to show up today? Mm -hmm. mm. So that's one thing I share in the book. Like don't sleep with your phone. Go out and buy a, an alarm clock. Or if you're like my wife, just develop a, a routine. Like if you have to wake up and you, if you have to have your phone by your side, just develop a ritual where it helps you prevent checking email first thing in the morning or checking social first thing in the morning. Because what I like to do is once I wake up, I go downstairs, I will grab my phone. I don't check it yet. But the first thing I have is a glass of water, 20 ounces, because the brain mm -hmm. needs water. The body needs to be hydrated for a great mind body connection. It needs to be hydrated. If it's not, um, then we don't perform as well as we can. So I grab 20 ounces of water, something like this. And I just, you know, as I'm drinking my water, I sort of think about, all right, what's in front of me today? How do I want to show up? How do I want to be? What do I want to do? And what do I want to see more of or have more of? Something else mm -hmm. that I talk about in the book. And then I'll do a little bit of just getting my mind and body connected. It could be some stretching. It could be some, you know, some basic exercises. I might get my bike ride on then, depending on my day. But at minimum, I don't check email right away. I grab my water, think about how I want to show up. I might get my exercise on. And then maybe I'll, at that point in time, I'll check my email, check show, social, and then we can begin the day but I can begin the day with some thoughtfulness. Mm -hmm. At night, and this is one thing I've learned through my recovery, because in the early phases, all I saw was everything I lost and everything I couldn't do anymore. So mm -hmm. I found this whole practice called gratitude. Back in 2001, we didn't ever talk about gratitude. <laughs> like We didn't know anything about that, right? Now today we're like, oh yeah, it's common. I've been doing it. Now we find people, oh, I've been doing it for 50 years. Like, you know, like, okay. All right. But some of this stuff like, you know, courage and, and resilience and vulnerability, like we didn't talk about vulnerability until we met Brene Brown. <laughs> we, we didn't talk about gratitude until it sort of became in the popular domain and how important it can be to help frame our day. So Craig, you talk about brushing your teeth. So each night before bed, I spend those minutes just thinking about what made the day a good day. It can be little small things, it can be major things, or it can even be things that sort of was sort of a struggle. You know, so today, as you know, like I had a medical procedure, I had my colonoscopy, something you need to do when you pass 50. And so it wasn't necessarily the pleasant, most pleasant thing, but it's certainly going to be part of my gratitude tonight that, hey, you know, I did something to promote my value of health. Mm -hmm. And so I use gratitude as a way to frame the day because if we don't, then we can certainly spend so much time thinking about like what went wrong during the day. Mm, definitely. And we go to sleep with that type of mental like notion in our head. So gratitude just gives a good counterbalance. And is, again, it's a good bookend to mm. helping you have a great day. And one of the reasons why I can say my last bad day was my last bad day is that when I have my wife and my daughters in my life, then how could I ever label that day as a bad one? Yeah. I can have bad moments, sad moments, challenging moments, but never a bad day, mm -hmm. you know, because I always have something through gratitude that I can build upon for tomorrow.
Mm-hmm. I love it. Totally. I love that you, you're linking rituals with other rituals or habits with other habits. And I think it's so powerful that because then you can, it's that cue to go, okay, it's time to think like that. Otherwise, otherwise it just goes, your day just goes, as, as you say. So you also mentioned um, how important it is to surround yourself with the right people. And who do you surround yourself with? Well, guys like you guys, right? So, <laughs> you know, uh, like in all seriousness, you know, so I think knowing who is in your Peloton, which again is like my metaphor for a tribe or a team, you know, I, I try to surround myself with people who will challenge my thinking. I think that's good. I think sometimes we can get really comfortable and sort of run to our tribal corners and only believe what we want to believe and mm-hmm. surround ourselves with people that will validate that. So I try to push some boundaries and hang out with people that might have a different point of view. I certainly want to be around people that can be great in a crisis or great to celebrate. But most importantly, I want to try to be around people who also see the world abundantly, that want to make a difference in the world, that are optimistic, but not not like rose-colored glass, glasses, unicorns, and rainbow optimistic, like practical optimism. Like mm. we can like we can do this. Like we, you know, we can make the world a better place. That yeah, even as we go through struggle, and we're certainly going through globally a lot of political struggle. But we can take moments from this moment and build upon those as we go forward. Mm. And I tend to hang with people that also see that. Um, that but, but also can push each other, as I mentioned earlier. Like we're all pushing each other, not because we're trying to one-up each other, but we're trying to bring out the best in each other. Like mm. I love hanging with those people. And mm. the type of people too, like when you fall down, when you trip, because you're going to trip, you're going to fall. You're going to scrape your knee. You're going to have, you ride your bike long enough. You're going to crash. They're the first people you see. They're the first hand you see picking you back up again. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they, they're not the type of person that rides off, right? Yeah. <laughs> they stop and they pick you up and they brush you off and you grab their wheel and you carry on. So I, I, you know, I get to choose and I think we all get to choose. Who do we want to hang with? And those are the type of people I like to hang with. Very cool. Yeah, man. beautiful. So, so Obi, look, um, it's been an amazing chat. Uh, thank you for a few extra minutes there. Um, just before Gareth asks you the, the last sort of question, um, what are you planning and, um, at the moment going forward? And, um, and also, where can people contact you? Well, the best place is just through my website, which is michaelobrienshift.com. And then from there, they can find me on social media and ring me or email me and all that just like that. I would say the next big thing, now that the book is out, you know, trying to hopefully get in the hands of more people, you know, so they can prevent bad moments from turning into bad days. Mm. But it's also building that portal that I mentioned earlier around showcasing all the wonderful people like us stories around their last bad days around grit and resilience and community like uh, i to be honest i don't have a perfect roadmap for it but i know this is that with the right people we can figure it out and we can build it over time and that's you know that's one thing that i'm really passionate about because i believe i lived on that last bad day for a reason and at times i didn't know what that reason was but today i do believe it's a to leverage my my story to bring other stories forward to inspire more people and change the world in in a small way or maybe even a, in a bigger way mm. well i think you certainly are changing it in a in a big way but so uh, really really excited about all those things for you so you you obviously listen to our podcast so you're probably aware of what our last question is these days <laughs> so what does being ridiculously human mean to you I think it means being flossom. Awesome. So, <laughs> I've never shared this with you, Gareth. So, this is a combination of awesome, because you know, like in, a lot of times in my blog post, I'll be like, awesome sauce, right? So co- one combination of awesome and one combination of having flaws. <laughs> Together, it's flossom. I love it. <laughs> so because nice. we, we all have flaws, we have scars and pimples and blemishes and wrinkles and mistakes 
that's just part of being ridiculously human. And we also have this wonderful, awesome quality to all of us, which again, mm -hmm. is also ridiculously human. And I think together, I think it's a really cool word. I'm not even sure if it's a word, but right now it's a word. So oh, right now it totally and, is one of the coolest yeah, I, words. I just, I just, and, and if we can like show up with all our flossomeness, <laughs> like how much cooler would life be? I think life would be so much cooler. Yeah, that right. is so cool. Uh, that, that is actually probably the, the, the best of all your <laughs> sayings because you have so many sayings and like I think <laughs> awesome source has always been up there, but flawsome definitely takes it. But so thanks. I'll totally be using that myself as well. Yeah, you, <laughs> but crediting you, don't worry all about your that. Listeners but. can use it. I, I, there's yeah. no trademark on that one. <laughs> and it, it, it's, it's a happy like coincidence that it almost sounds like effing awesome. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, <laughs> I yeah, dig that as well. Like, <laughs> yeah, I yeah, know. I just, I like, I, I sort of love the concept of it because I think it's, you know, I, I think if we could show up that way, we can, like, God, like we could change, yeah. we could change so many of our conversations and mm. so many of our relationships. Yeah, it's that authenticity, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like by being flawsome as epic. Yeah, it's mm. me. You know yeah. what you see. Yeah, is what you get, and. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And what you get, like for all of us, is one part flaws and blemishes and one part awesome. Yeah. Beautiful. That's for sure, man. Hey, OB, man, I seriously, I can't thank you so enough. It's, it's just been so great speaking to you again. And, and this definitely has that Godfather 2 uh, feel to it in terms of the sequel. Seriously, it's, it's just so amazing. You, you totally speak our language, bud. And um as you probably know, we also do a, a podcast off the back of this called Superhumanship, where we kind of dissect these conversations. And Craig and I try and keep those to like 20 minutes or so, but this one is going to be absolutely impossible because I was literally <laughs> listening the whole time to what you're saying, going, wow, this is just like streams and streams of, of value and wisdom and mm -hmm. notes and stuff. And um, it was just so much stuff in there for, you know, so much value that you, that you sort of gave us and our listeners. So thank you so much for that. And you know what, uh, you, you just come across as this flawsome person. And, and that's what I think is so engaging about you is like, it makes you so relatable. Um, and I think, you know, that's what people want in life. And uh, that's certainly what we want in life. And like, why well, I definitely connect so much with you. And it's just uh, this amazing trait and quality to have. Um, and also, but I mean, I know we only chatted to you, I mean, 70 episodes ago, so it was like a year and a half, but I even feel like the evolution of OB and the, the progress as a person and, and your message and how you sort of say that message has just grown massively, mm. uh, even within that short space of time. So congratulations, you oh, know, you're, you. You're a real inspiration to us and definitely to me. Like I always look up to you as a person and, and what you're doing and, and just wanted to, you know, say thanks so much for like, you know, that, that you, that you're part of, of our community, that you're part of my life. And, um, it's just, uh, it really means a lot and it's really special. So thanks brother. And, uh, yeah, you're just a, you're a great man. So wishing you all the best for everything. Thanks for this amazing book and, um, just keep being a flawsome legend. Cool. Thanks, Gareth. <laughs> Uh, uh, sentiments uh, back right at you so um i value both of you you know you craig you gareth you know great guys to have in my life and um our our friendship is although we're halfway around the world from each other <laughs> is uh something i cherish and something i'm really grateful for thanks buddy. how cool is that hey like how cool is that we can that we can have those kind of relationships and and find the people out of these how many billion of the uh, out there that you can have those connections and uh, I'm also super grateful for, for our connection and, um, and, and our friendship and, and just the value as Gareth said, I, I couldn't agree more with, with all that, what he said, um, you know, you've done so much inner work, Obi, you've, you've really done the hard work of coming through things and working through things and thinking about things and, and, and it just shows so much because you, you're really celebrating life now and, and you can just see it and, and that's just such an infectious thing. And, you know, talking about surrounding yourself with the right people, um, people that are celebrating life are, is definitely something that I want to hang or be around. And, and that's, it reminds you to celebrate those days day to day, you know, and, it, and yeah, it's just such a great reminder. And the other thing was that, um, you know, you speak about one person helping 
making one person happy or helping one person. And I mean, you've got guaranteed at least two um, <laughs> and, you know, and guaranteed a whole lot more. So keep up the great work. You are making an impact in this world for the better. And uh, we love what you're doing. So uh, uh, thanks again for the, for the friendship and the knowledge. Thanks guys. That was awesome. So yeah, we'll start with you two and then, um, you know, we'll cascade <laughs> from, from there. there right? <laughs> <laughs> Cool. cool awesome source. Thanks a lot, Ob. Stuff, thanks, my man. And uh, yeah, sorry. So thank, thanks for also like giving us that extra minute, so like oh, extra fifteen you. minutes. Normally we would like finish it off, but I, I just you were just providing so much sort of value bombs there. I was like, let's just finish these. No problem. Back. It was great. It was uh, great to be with you guys, and it was yeah. a lot of just a lot of fun to do it the second yeah. time. So yeah. I definitely appreciate you guys. Certainly now, like with the book coming now, look at yeah. the platform so people can cool. share it and, yeah. and and get it. And you know, the, the great the great thing is that people are reading it and they're like, "Wow, it's like, it's everything that I wanted." Like every tone I wanted to strike you know, in terms of being practical and relatable. So yeah, yeah, that's um, awesome. So yeah, so it's um, so thanks for sharing it, helping me share it into the world. Pleasure, buddy. And another. Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour, and up in the air, stop at the toll, digging.